Hello everyone and welcome to Six Feet Apart Productions. We are delighted and honoured to be co-producing this event with the Storytelling Association of California, a part of their Stories in Living Colour series. Um, the objective of this show is to promote awareness of LWAP, which is Life Without Parole, but it is also a fundraiser for the California Coalition for Women's Prisoners and the Drop LWAP campaign. You'll see a link often throughout the um, show, please go to that link. We'll also put it in the chat. Anything that you can do to support this very, very worthy cause will be most gratefully appreciated. Um, thank you. So now in tonight's show, what you're going to hear, there's going to be, we've got two MCs and four people telling their stories about their experiences within the prison system. Um, the two MCs are also going to host a question and answer session at the end of the show. So in a minute, I'm going to introduce the two MCs and then they're going to um, go through and introduce, introduce each teller in turn. They'll then tell about a 10 minute story. After the stories, <clears throat> during the Q&A, at that point, you can ask your question. So if you put it into the live chat on YouTube and we'll, we'll tell you again at the time, then we'll take it and we'll make sure that the MCs get it and we'll be moderating that. Um, also, if you have any other questions during the show, please put it in the YouTube and we'll happy to um, answer it and do our best we can. Also, just so you know, the show is recorded. So after the show, you can come back and re-watch it at the same link that you're watching it at now. OK, on to our show. So our first MC is Courtney Hansen. Courtney is the Development and Communications Coordinator for the California Coalition for Women Prisoners. Courtney is an organiser who has focused on dismantling carceral systems for the past decade. Growing up with an aunt in prison who was a survivor of domestic violence, Courtney's work is committed to ending gender-based oppression in all its forms. Our second MC tonight is Romarilyn Ralston. Romarilyn is the program director of Project Rebound at CSU Fullerton, and she's also the co-chair of the project's policy and advocacy committee. Romarilyn is a black feminist prison abolitionist scholar, that was a mouthful, working to interrupt criminalization at the intersection of race, gender and education. She fights for the release of women, gender non-conforming and trans people. So please welcome to our virtual stage, Courtney Hansen and Romarilyn Ralston. Hello, welcome. Thank you to everybody, our YouTube audience, everybody who chose to show up to this important event this evening or whatever time it is, wherever you are. We are so grateful to have you here in the audience. And we just want to start with a little bit of basic information and grounding before we invite our storytellers to come on. And so my name is Courtney. Um, I wanted to just tell you that CCWP, the California Coalition for Women Prisoners, has been around for 25 years. We were founded in 1995 by incarcerated women, trans people, formerly incarcerated people, and outside advocates coalescing around a class action lawsuit demanding the end of deadly medical neglect in California women's prisons, which unfortunately continues to this day. And so for the past two and a half decades, We've done advocacy alongside, with, and for people currently incarcerated in California women's prisons, medical neglect, reproductive violence, supporting people in their parole board preparation, supporting people when they do come home and they return into our communities um, in leadership development, re-entry support, and keeping people involved in the movement that won't forget about those that are still inside. So we monitor and challenge abusive conditions. We try to change policy and prevent people from going into the prison system to begin with. And one of our most important campaigns is called the Drop LWAP campaign, which is a, a campaign to abolish life without the possibility of parole as a sentence. And this is a sentence, as extreme as it is, that is applied in extremely arbitrary, cruel, and racist ways. And frankly, it's shocking when you start to hear people's stories who have lived with this sentence, and especially those who have 
found ways to actually come home and share their stories and keep fighting for people inside. So thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting CCWP and our Drop LWAP campaign. And with that, I will pass it over to my colleague, Romarilyn Ralston. Thank you so much, Courtney. Welcome to our audience on Zoom and YouTube and special thanks to our sponsors and storytellers tonight. My name is Romarilyn Ralston. I am so honored to be here. I'm a proud member of the California Coalition for Women Prisoners. First, I'd just like to acknowledge the weight of the topic at, at hand tonight. We'll be addressing issues of mass incarceration, extreme sentencing, interpersonal violence, trauma, and other issues that may be hard to listen to. But this evening, we have four incredible stories of reconciliation, of redemption, and of hope. These stories will open our hearts and minds to what is the meaning of life. The stories you're about to hear are human stories filled with pain and transformation. We acknowledge the weight of the topics at hand tonight, and we are here to support you, our listeners, and whatever you may need from our storytellers. But before we move into those very important stories, we like to share some facts for context. Did you know the United States holds 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's incarcerated population? Does this make us safe? Another very important fact, the average age that we sentence someone to life without the possibility of parole in the state of California is 19 years old. What is the purpose of extreme and perpetual punishment? Between 1980 and 2019, the number of incarcerated women increased by more than 700%. But crime has not risen. The majority have a history of physical or sexual abuse. How do so many survivors end up criminalized? And lastly, in California, in the Golden State, a Black man is over eight times more likely to be incarcerated than a white man. Is this a system truly about justice? We're gonna hear about these issues from our storytellers tonight. First, we'll be starting with Susan Bustamante. Susan Bustamante is an organizer with the California Coalition for Women Prisoners, CCWP. Susan grew up in Southern California and was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole in 1987. After serving 31 years in prison, she received a commutation from Governor Jerry Brown, which allowed her to apply for parole. Susan was paroled and released in, in September of 2018, 36 months ago. She is an activist, a mother, a grandmother, a great grandmother, and my friend. Please welcome this terrific and incredible advocate, Susan Bustamante. Thank you, Ro Marilyn. I was 32 when I went to prison with the sentence of life without the possibility of parole. As a victim of child molestation and a domestic violence survivor, I needed a lot of emotional help. Having the LWAP sentence is like having the death sentence without any legal assistance to writs. You have no parole 
no way to gain your freedom, no way to shout, hey, I don't belong here. I was one of the original members of the battered women's group to understand how I ended up in the situation I was in. Having to face the living death sentence, I decided it was time for personal change. It was extremely hard to face one's faults, but I did and learned the cycle of violence and the road to healing. I had the ability to participate in the Native American sweat ceremony where you face yourself in prayer and healing. To sit in ceremony, it is pitch dark and extremely hot. In the dark and sitting in prayer, it's a different type of suffering because there is nowhere to hide. Nobody to relieve the emotions but me. It allowed me to release the anger, the hatred. I was able to forgive and be forgiven. Oh, sorry. Um, within myself was my standing point of going forward, starting point of going forward. There's a tremendous amount of loss on now what basis. For example, I used to have family visits, but they were taken away for several years. It was the connection I had to raising my two daughters and having that connection with my mother. When the prison brought back family visits, I wasn't allowed to participate with the new rule that came with them. If an Elwes victim was a family member, you were excluded from utilizing the visits. For example, my victim was my husband. As the years passed by, I had watched many friends die from aging, cancer, bad medical care, and just outright neglect. The one thing that used to happen when a woman was close to dying is they would be transferred to then be in a new prison without comfort of people they knew. I remember being called up to the officer station, then being escorted to the chapel. I was 38 years old at the time when I was told that my oldest sister had passed away unexpectedly. It knocked me to my knees. I still cry for her. That night I had a compassionate staff member who walked me around our small institution for about an hour at 10 o'clock at night which really didn't happen normally to process my loss. There was never closure for me, losing my mother, father, sister, and nephew during the 31 years. You can never go to funerals with life sentence. Being barely 32, when I went to prison, the years just go by with no hope of ever going home. I kept thinking that the system would work, that a lawyer would be able to get a new trial or that a new bill for domestic violence would affect my sentence. But a reality was I had the LWAP sentence, life without the possibility of parole, death sentence, and wasn't going anywhere unless in a pine box. There were so many women who are survivors who kept hope, yet they are still incarcerated, still no relief of freedom. There were groups like the California Coalition for Women Prisoners who poured hearts in their hearts into helping that keeping me going because I was one of the people they didn't forget. To receive letters and legal visits lets an AWAP know they aren't forgotten, which means the world to someone having no way out of a strange that a stranger says, I care. Feeling my body aging aching and praying that I would never get sick because I saw what happens to those that do get sick. Sitting on my bed decade after decade with the door slamming behind me gave me such a hopeless feeling knowing that death was the only relief there was. Being commuted by Governor Brown after 31 years gave me hope and renewed my effort to gain my freedom. I'm home now for three years and say to anybody listening, that nobody deserves to be thrown away. Everybody deserves a second chance. Society has gained many well-deserving people back through commutations, and I pray that many more families get to experience the joy of welcoming their loved ones back. 
please I ask that you get involved in joining the movement to end life without the possibility of parole and donate so that group the group has the resources to achieve this goal. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan, for sharing such a powerful and important story with us tonight. And we thank you so much for being an advocate against intimate partner violence. Our next story is by Howard Lieberman. Howard is an aging political activist, writer, and storyteller whose personal narrative art lives on the uneasy edge of storytelling. Howard is a moderately nice, formerly homeless Jewish boy who found his way to New York City where he eventually became an attorney. Irish dance teacher and director of the Irish Arts Center. Hating what NYC brought out in him, Howard moved to Stillwater, Minnesota in 1990 to experience living among passive aggressive Lutherans and bitter cold and shockingly still calls it home. Howard, thank you so much for being with us tonight. We look forward to hearing your story. I'm working in San Francisco, staying at the Omni Hotel on California Street in a plush junior suite befitting a professional legal consultant who makes his living flying around North America, advising on law firm mergers on behalf of the largest and most prominent anti-worker labor and employment firm in the world. The firm that proudly crushed Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers strike. I don't know how I feel about representing that firm, but I, I don't do their work. I, I just help them get bigger. And, and I think that that must be okay because I'm not one of them, I'm me. One evening while walking down California street in, in designer jeans that probably cost $280, Chris blue chambray cotton shirt and mahogany covered colored crocodile boots. I'm walking down to the Embarcadero to grab dinner at the slanted door, a pricey Asian restaurant that always has a seat at the bar for me, for which I will be reimbursed by the client. On the way down, I stop and admire my reflection in a store window and I feel like a big fucking deal. On my way back up to the Omni, a down on his luck man sitting on the street catches my eye and asks for a little something, just a little something to get him, get him dinner. Well, like most people, I generally don't stop to give money to, 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 to street people, those people, but this time my heart says stop. So I do. And I give the man a $1 bill and smugly continue on my way because I gave him paper instead of coins. And as I reach the Omni's front entrance, I suddenly stop and begin weeping uncontrollably, uncontrollably. The doorman, who knows me because I'm a regular at the Omni, he asks if everything is okay, Mr. Lieberman. I shout to no one in particular, fuck me, just fuck me, and, and turn around and I walk back down California until I find that man on the street. It's dark, but eventually I find the man and ask after asking his permission, I sit down next to him and with tears and snot rolling down my face 
and onto my stupid blue chambray shirt, I give the man four twenties, which was everything I had, and apologize for being a cheap, arrogant asshole. I look into the man's eyes and see someone who was me not that long ago on some street hustling for money and any place to sleep. We sit for hours in chilly San Francisco night talking, crying and, and sharing something sweet and alcoholic out of a brown paper bag. I tell him stories about my being orphaned at 14 and homeless at 16, about the psychological abuse I suffered at the hands of people who took me in and gave me a home, about sleeping wherever I could, and how on more than one occasion, cops arrested and even beat me for being a drunk street person, occasionally throwing me in jail and charging me with bullshit. And how after one particularly bad beating, I walked around town and sat with a group of men and women drinking the same thing we were drinking tonight. And I knew I wanted to just give up, die alone on the street, smelling of cheap booze and dope. I really meant it. And I would have done just that. I was ready, I, if, I was ready to die. But one kid about my age literally slapped me across the face hard and told me to shut the fuck up about dying, that I was smart and to get the fuck away and live a real life. I told that kid to fuck off. So he pushed me into the street and told me to get lost. I stumbled away and slept somewhere. That encounter began a multi-year journey of finding out who I was and why the world hated the sight of me. The man on the street in San Francisco told me his story about being poor, but having a decent job, family, but how his addiction to booze and drugs triggered voices, hallucinations, and eventually led to jail and institutionalization for crazy folks like him. How one day he was kicked out of that place and wound up in a crappy halfway house that kicked him out. And how he was in and out of jail for bullshit, then out on the street. And here he is. And this is where he plans to stay until he's gone. Dead. Dead! He tells me he's free on the street. And I know. I know. We talked and cried until the sun came up, then went to breakfast somewhere and walked back to his spot on the Embarcadero. I offered to take him to the Omni for a good sleep and a good meal when he woke up. He looked at me and said, thanks, but with come on man eyes, eyes that said, you know, and I did know, I wouldn't have gone either. Then the man on California street looked at me and said, the only reason you in fancy clothes and I'm on the street is you're a white boy. White boys get chances black folks don't get. Now go on back to your fancy hotel. Go on. And then he turned to look at something I couldn't see. I went back to my junior suite at the Omni, showered, shaved, and stood naked in front of a mirror who looked back at me was a homeless, abused teenage boy who had lost his way. Seriously lost his way. I promised that boy from that moment forward, I would devote my life, my art, my legal skills fighting for social justice, to help at-risk youth find and tell their stories, to learn, to own and love who they are, 
to help incarcerated persons fight for respect, freedom, and justice. Well, I eventually fired my client, or actually they fired me. I don't know, who knows? And over time, I've pretty much Dutch, pretty much done what I what I what I promised that boy I would do. I've also gone broke. Well, actually worse. I'm in debt way above my eyeballs. But I'm okay though. I'm okay. In fact, I'm better than okay. Because the boy who looks back at me naked in my mirror every morning is smiling. So is the adult that boy eventually became. Thank you. Thank you so much, Howard, for sharing that very powerful story with us. You truly are the prodigal son. You have experienced it all. Before we move to our next storyteller, I'd like to invite our YouTube audience to please put questions or comments in the chat. We'd love to hear from you. We appreciate you being a part of this conversation tonight. Also to our Zoom audience, thank you so much for putting your questions and comments in the chat. And we invite you to continue to do that. As we move forward with the next two stories, just want to remind you all that these stories are real. They are painful, but they have promise. They have hope. Our next storyteller, is Michael D. Michael D. McCarty, as he likes to be called. Ever since discovering the world of professional storytelling in 1992, Michael D. McCarty has been telling stories and teaching storytelling around the world. He specializes in stories of African and African-American history and culture and multicultural stories. Since 2014, Michael has worked in California prisons as part of the Arts in Corrections program, supporting incarcerated people in finding, developing, and telling their own stories. His life has been one heaven of a story. Student activist, Black Panthers, U.S. Army martial arts instructor, acupuncturist, acupuncturist, world traveler, spiritual seeker, construction worker, storyteller, husband, father, and friend who loves his life. Michael D. It is time to hear your story. Michael, you're on mute. You're going to have to unmute yourself. Okay. There we go. Now you can hear me running my mouth. Here we go. Um, this story started right when I started doing the Arts and Corrections program in 2014. I was at Valley State Prison. And I tell guys on the first day, I'm going to show you how to find, develop, and tell your stories. And I do all kinds of things to get folks to find their stories, to have fun with their stories, to, to reach in and pull them out. There was this guy in my class named Daniel, and Daniel seemed bright and happy, and he enjoyed the class immensely. Most of the stories he told were takeoffs on traditional folk tales and things like that, and he was very good at it. One day, I was in between classes having lunch, and Daniel walked by, saw me, and said, uh, 
Mike, how you doing? When, when we talked a little bit, he said, uh, did I ever tell you why I'm here? I never ask. Sometimes it comes out in their stories. So Daniel told me his story. 16 years old, in a fit of rage, he kills his father, stepmother, one of his brothers, and one of his sisters. Now this rage came on from a whole lifetime of stuff. That's another story and a story for Daniel to tell. So I found out in him sharing this story with me that this was not a story that everybody in the prison, his cellmates and what have you knew. So towards the end of that first cycle, Daniel started telling his own story in the class in the third person. And over the summer, at the end of our sessions, over the summer, there was a YouTube spoken word event at the prison and Daniel volunteered to tell. He told his story again in the third person. The first day of my class in the fall, Daniel gets up and tells his story in the first person. Now, after he gets through telling his story, his friends, they come up and they thank him. They know how much it meant for him to be telling them that story, his true story in the first person. The following week, Daniel told me this. During the week, he had graduated from a year-long domestic violence training program. When he went for the graduation, ABC News Fresno was there. They were interviewing the guys about the class and what have you, and a reporter comes to him and says, so why are you here? And he tells ABC News Fresno his story in the first person. Well, it's now on ABC News, that story. The uh, story he did during the summer is on YouTube. After a few months, he starts getting letters and eventually phone calls from nieces and nephews he never knew existed. They had known about him. They knew he was in prison. They knew what he had done. But what they didn't know is his mindset. And once they saw that he was remorseful, they started contacting him, contacting him and even coming to visit him. Then. A few months later, he gets a special delivery package. It's letters from the wife and son of the brother he had killed, saying that they had seen him, they had seen that he had changed, that he was remorseful, that they had forgiven him, and they wanted him to be a part of their lives. So, Daniel, when he was 16 years old, he said he was one of the worst students in the school. Now it is, 20 years later, he gets a scholarship, a very prestigious scholarship from an agency that had never given scholarships to inmates before. And now, he leads his own domestic violence training program. I found out recently that, remember he had uh, his parole, his first parole was supposed to come in 175 years. He had a sentence of life plus a thousand years. I found out that, and this is what, these are his words, because he learned to find, develop, and tell his story, he now has a parole hearing next year. Next year. There's hope. And that is one of the things that we must give to people. People must have hope. We can give them hope by supporting them, by listening to them, to listening and not judging. And 
as we say in my class, that's the end of that. Thank you so much, Michael D, for that story. You are a fantastic storyteller. And we are looking forward to Daniel returning home to us soon. Amen. Amen. We have one more storyteller. We want to thank our audience for their generous donations tonight. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do the work that we do with CCWP and Drop LWAP without your generous support and contributions. Thank you so much. Because of people like you, we will be able to continue our work and hopefully Drop LWAP. We have another story. We have a story coming from Kelly Savage Rodriguez. Kelly Savage Rodriguez is the Drop LWAP coordinator for CCWP. And Kelly was released from prison at 46 years old after being incarcerated for 20 three years. Governor Jerry Brown commuted her life without the possibility of parole sentence on December 2017, allowing her to seek parole. She was an inside member of CCWP for 15 years and helped initiate CCWP's organizing to end life without parole with a living chance storytelling project and the launch of the Drop LWAP campaign. I've had the pleasure of working, aside, working uh, beside Kelly in the state capitol, in Sacramento, on the campaign to drop LWAP going door to door to legislators all the way to the governor's front door. Kelly is a fierce advocate. She is no nonsense. She is on a mission to liberate our people inside of cages across California. Kelly, we are so proud of the work that you are doing. We're so grateful to Governor Brown for commuting your sentence. And we are eager to hear your story. So please welcome our last storyteller of tonight, Ms. Kelly Savage Rodriguez. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Um, this is extremely important for me um, because it is about talking about incarcerated people as someone who has been involved in the system from a very early age. Um, my mother was incarcerated basically my whole life. And so not only did I visit institutions, but then did time with her. Um, as someone um, coming in with a no hope sentence, um, I came home saying, this is it, like, this is where I'm going to be, what can I do within, you know, this community, because that's all I'm going to have. Um, as a survivor of um, some extreme abuse situations, I uh, realized that using my voice was the only way that I was going to make the environment I was in better. Um, and I started in multiple different ways, um, just advocating for people in different situations within the institution. Um, and then I finally had the opportunity to try out for school. And I had just gotten my high school diploma two months before incarceration. And so I, I knew that my next step were to go um, for college, but I kept getting blocked and barriers because anyone serving life without is considered less than in the, in the prison community. 
um, it, whether it's for an educational thing, whether it's for vocations, regardless of what it may be, um, that you are, are deemed as um, the last person to receive resources because they want to ensure that people getting out sooner have opportunity first. So for me, not um, having a lot of options, I knew it was going to be a fight. Um, and I ended up applying, even though they told me I shouldn't, it was a waste of time. And so I applied to just take a single college class. And I was able to um, convince them just to allow me to go um, through the interview process, um, only because they knew me from some of the other things that I was involved in. And we purposely left off my sentence um, on the application to get in the door. And it turned out that um, the communication that I had that day um, with a acting administrator um, in the education building, um, that communication led her to kind of bypass the process and um, allow me for a second interview. And, you know, part of that was like understanding that I had privilege that others in the institution didn't have. And that didn't feel too great, but I knew I needed to get us in the door. And um, so going for my second interview, there was this big note uh, on, on my paperwork informing them that I was serving life without. So um, they're like, there's no way, you're, you know, there's not a lot we can do, but we can't take a position from someone else. And so I offered to share a book so it wouldn't take a position. Um, you know, I, I offered all different options and just kept expressing that everyone is redeemable, that serving any t amount of time and every single person has possibilities that others might not. Um, at that point, I was just getting approved for um, the domestic violence battering and effects laws. So I had a, um, an extra step up that would allow me the opportunity to be considered for possible court. So um, that helped me a little bit more and actually theology degrees that I had received um, helped give that final push. It was something that um, acting vice principal wanted to do in her own life. And the fact that I had four degrees um, allowed her to see that I was dedicated to doing work. And, um, and when I was done, it, took a, it was a long process and it took me about two years, but I got them to consider every single person who applied as an individual and not as a person serving life without. It was extremely difficult to do um, because, you know, in, in every area and, and facet of the process, it, it was always considered over and over again. Yeah, but your time. Yeah, but your time. And you guys aren't going anywhere. I said, but we're educating our, not only ourselves, we're educating our families by giving them hope and, and teaching our younger generation that they need to also go to school if we're fighting to go to school. Um, there were so many areas that it could be beneficial, as well as when someone does get released because the sentence should not be final. And as we continue to fight, it cannot stay. California can't keep the system of lock them up, throw away the key and nobody's redeemable. It's just not possible. Um, and it's just not humane. And so I, in that um, avenue of, of pushing forward, I was able to get um, 21 people within the first two years in the program with me that were also serving um, Life Without, and they all graduated at the same time as me. It took us a little bit longer. It took us three years instead of two, but the prison setting, that was a really good timeline, and it showed just how dedicated they were, and then they opened up the um, across the board in several other institutions as well to allow them to take classes um, where they couldn't before. And that was extremely important to me to be able to do that. There's so many ways that a person serving life without is denied basic access to whether it's education or um, whether it's an opportunity even to get medical care, depending on your sentence, you might be denied options um, to receive certain specialty treatment because 
there's an extra security level that must take place. And so it's just important to acknowledge in all areas that they're deemed different. And the only reason they're different, their crimes are no different than someone else's. The, the only difference is the DA gets to decide if they're going after a special circumstance in a crime versus um, a, um, a, a DA who might choose not to do that. So you can have someone in your cell that has the same kind of case situation, but their DA didn't seek um, that special circumstances. And that's the only difference that gets somebody to be deemed unredeemable and gives them no opportunity for nothing more in life. And that is extremely difficult. There's so many individuals, you know, the age of somebody incarcerated is about um, 19. You got to give a little give and take, but most start their time that young. And it is extremely difficult to say, you know, sit down and only work a yard crew or a porter position for the rest of your life and don't educate yourself. You know, you can't get into a lot of vocations. You can't support yourself financially because you can't have a workable job that's going to allow you to provide for yourself instead of seeking support from family. And that is extremely demeaning for all individuals. And we hope that as we continue this fight, we educate more legislators and um, individuals in the community who will see that everyone deserves a right to fight for freedom. And at this point, this sentence does not do that. Um, and it's extremely difficult. I was blessed just to be someone considered for commutation, but there's so many people that I have left behind that I work with every single day, whether it's to prepare them for a commutation or support them as they go through the court process that are just as deserving and just as remorseful and looking at ways to give back to their community right where they're at. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Kelly, for sharing your story. Thank you for being here with us. We're so proud of you and the work that you're doing. And we appreciate your resistance inside of that prison. And we encourage you to continue to seek education as high as you wanna go. So thank you so much. Uh, joining me on screen, as you can see, is Courtney Hansen. Uh, she's back as we uh, transition into our Q&A. So Courtney, I will pass the mic to you. I've been talking quite a bit, uh, but before uh, I do that, I do wanna share with the audience and, and uh, everyone here tonight telling stories that like Susan, and, and Kelly, I was also incarcerated, serving a life sentence, not a life without the possibility of parole sentence. But it was because of you, Susan, and women like you, Kelly, that I made it through those 23 years as a lifer. When I arrived in prison, Susan, you were there. You, you mentored me. You helped to heal me. You helped to make me the person that I am today. And to you and Kelly and all of the other women at CIW and at CCWF and those who have paroled and especially to Leslie Van Houten and to Patricia Krenwinkel and to Susan Atkins, may she rest in peace. For all of those matriarchs who are behind the wall who continue to survive against insurmountable odds. I want you all to know how much you mean to those of us coming into those spaces with very little hope and watching you be denied basic care, basic services, and still walk around with your heads held high. You're an inspiration to us. And we wouldn't have been able to make it without people like you. So thank you. 
Thank you, Ro Marilyn. Thank you, Susan Kelly, Howard, Michael D. Thank you, everyone engaging um, on the YouTube chat. I see some people starting to throw out questions. We do have a little segment now where we'll um, we'll start by bringing in Susan and Kelly. We do have a question specifically for you. And then um, once we move through that, we'll have all the storytellers come on at once. Um, and so if you do still have questions, feel free to drop that in the chat. We might not get to every single one, but we have space in the program for this. So we'll try. Um, our first question for you, Susan or Kelly, either of you could start, is really, you know, prior to experiencing this personally and being incarcerated, can you think back to sort of how you thought about incarceration generally, or did you ever imagine that you could end up in prison? Kelly, you touched a bit on um, your family and your mother. I don't know if you wanna start, but if you both could respond to that, that would be great. Yeah, definitely. Um, for me, I never thought I would be incarcerated. I was afraid to even drive my own car because I didn't have a license yet. Um, and so I did everything I thought possible to ensure that I wouldn't um, land in the same position as my mother and, and other family members. Um, but I think when it happened, I think that was the hardest part. Um, my crime happened as I was trying to leave a domestic violence situation and following the plan that um, Domestic Violence Hotline had set up for me. But unfortunately, I was in a town um, that didn't have the capacity to have housing back then. And so my only option was Greyhound. And so um, knowing that there was no other means um, finding myself incarcerated was really difficult, but finding out just how many other people serving the sentence um, could tell the same story, um, that lived the same kind of um, hardship that they weren't, you know, it's not like most individuals set out to, you know, I want to harm somebody. Things happen in the spur of the moment and, um, and harm does occur and that's really horrible. However, that doesn't mean that they don't have a right or the ability to do better and be better. Um, Susan? For me, it was um, no, because of the fact that um, gone through what I went through with my father in you know, molestation, I was good at doing what I was told, you know, and I never, I didn't date. I didn't go to parties. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I, you know, so uh, to end up in prison just startled me, you know, and it was, it shows me how easy you can end up in prison, especially for something you didn't do. You know, you cannot control somebody else's actions and yet you serve the time. That is what's being fought right now, which is so important. Thank you so much for sharing, Susan and Kelly. Uh, I have a question for both of you. What takeaway do you have for our audience or what, what is it that you want people to understand about the meaning of life without the possibility of parole? It, it's hopelessness, it's helplessness. It, um, but yet you dig deep and you find that survivor mode. You do try to heal. You do try to, um, you get up every day. You do what you got to do because one day, maybe, you know, you keep that mustard seed, but it still takes people on the outside, not leaving them in the dead zone to where they're by themselves. They have to always know somebody is there. And that's what um, these groups CCWP, that's what they do. They encourage you just to know that there may be, there's a rainbow somewhere at the end of the at the end of it. There's that pot of gold. And this is my pot of gold is doing this. Thank you, Susan. Um, I think for me it's understanding that um, even though someone's serving the sentence is um, treated as less than in the institution when it comes to having 
basic needs met, attending groups, uh, fighting for healing. Um, and, and an individual is forced to be the last on the line, but they're the first ones that uh, custody staff will ask to help, um, you know, control a unit, to run a group, to participate um, as a facilitator in different things. And um, I found more individuals that facilitate groups and and try to help create um, a balanced unit or a balanced workplace or try to just motivate like you know we were really lucky when I left uh, Valley State and went to CCWF we saw trees for the first time for me it had been 15 years at Valley State where we weren't allowed to even have a you know a single flower growing or you know you'd be punished for it um, but when we got over there you know, there was a group of these LWOPs who were creating gardens on every single yard. And so seeing first tree, very strange experience. Um, it was the middle of the night in the middle of fog and I ran into uh, a bush and I couldn't understand what I was seeing um, because I had, it, that wasn't part of my experience for so long that I was de deprived of basic things. Um, but when I got there and realized that when I was searching for my people, they were all outside working, you know, in the garden and, you know, with the different areas to, to beautify the institution because this was our home. And um, when I went to search for people to facilitate some of the groups that we brought that, you know, I found them there too. And it was those people um, all are motivating to try to do better you know people think of people in the incarcerated system as people who sit around and watch tv and and play cards i hear that all the time there's no time for that you're running from your set job to um, different um, self-help programs you're lucky if you have a break in between to do your college homework because you're fighting to be in college and and you know you're you're grouping whether it's through the mail or you know, a, a group, I know um, if you were in my group, you knew it was going to be serious and you knew you were going to have homework because it's about healing. And those things happen because we all fought for each other. You know, CDCR does not rehabilitate, even though they say they do. We help community and we help re rehabilitate. Um, we help provide the groups. We create the groups. They might get paid for sitting in a room, but they're not teaching curriculum they're just monitoring the space while we teach while we educate while we sit there and help somebody as they grieve um, one of my um, most amazing blessing was sitting with people at the end of their life and um, doing hospice care with them and unfortunately way too many people had to do that but out of a group of 30 27 that uh, um, that worked the program, 27 out of, I believe, 150 total that had worked the program, 27 of them were LWOPs fighting to make sure that no one died alone. And that is a normal process we see all the time inside the institution, us fighting for each other, because that's what we're supposed to do. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Susan. Thank you both so much for humanizing our lives in prison. Thank you so much for sharing those stories of, of hope and triumph. Next, we're going to bring in Michael D. and Howard to join the conversation with Susan and Kelly. And we're going to take some questions for the, from the audience. So please continue to put those questions in the chat. Our YouTube audience, continue to share questions and comments. Uh, we want to hear from you. Courtney? Thank you. Um, and I see some really great questions being dropped about specifics around life without parole, how laws have changed or haven't around domestic violence. So I hope we can get to a couple of those. But just more generally, is something that touches on sort of some of the common threads surfacing in between all your stories. Um, we wanted to ask, and um, I'm happy to just pick on one of you if that's easier to start, but how has your own trauma, that is something that is coming up a lot here tonight, contributed to the way that you see this issue 
or why you care about it. Um, if it's okay, if I do pick on people, Howard, maybe you want to start us off, but each and every story really did hit on this in one way or another. So whenever you're ready to come off mute. To me, um, I spent a good part of my life forgetting who I was. And, you know, the people who were without permanent homes, people who, who we call the homeless, which is probably to me is a degrading term, a degrading term as any, um, we don't see these people. But people fall into, people usually who've suffered abuse, people who've wound up having to live um, on the street, these are people who often find themselves institutionalized, whether it's this man I was talking to wound up in a basically an institution for for what well, he said crazy people, I think it was for criminally insane people. Um, everything about our society, if you don't fit a particular mold, you're streamlined into that other track, the one where the good people don't have to see you. Um, and if we put them in institutions and keep the streets clean, well, isn't that good for everybody? And um, and I, I think my role in this evening, and I had questions about it as, as the rest of the people know, is um, I, I haven't been heavily, I had spent some time in jail, but it was, you know, bleeding and, and didn't spend a whole lot of time there. Um, but a lot of the people I know, a lot of the people I met, a lot of the people on the street did wind up um, incarcerated. And so I guess I would implore people, understand that every single person is a human being. Every single person has good qualities and has some bad qualities, we all do. But don't just walk on by, don't just cross the street, whatever you do, you know, love your humans, love your fellow humans, don't, don't, you know, they have pain. And that's, and that's, you know, that's, that's, I don't know if I answered the question, but that's kind of how I feel. I think you did answer the question. And I think your whole story sort of organically and really beautifully answered that question. But thank you for kind of putting a fine point on it. Um, Michael, do you want to come off mute and chime in on this question? And I'm happy to repeat it if you need. Yes, please repeat it. So how has um, sort of your own uh, personal experiences you know, it's about sort of empathy, maybe your own experiences of trauma contribute to how you see this issue of incarceration and why you care about it. One of the things that I say when I first start each class is that the difference between me and somebody in prison, I was lucky and I had a good lawyer. And sometimes it's as simple as that. Um, I've met so many people who, wrong place, wrong time. Um, I remember there was a guy, he, he just got out. He went to hang with his old friends. And one of them said, would you hold my peace while I go in here? And of course, and he's spirited away. It's sometimes just a matter of that, of wrong place, wrong time. The thing, that I see in my work is that the experiences I've had in my life have prepared me to do this work. I've been on the other side of the law in a variety of ways. I was a revolutionary. I was a drug dealer. I was an idiot on various points in time. And when I started working in prison, I understood that I could show them something that would help when they understand and get in touch with their story. Just a quick example, um, there was a guy in my class, uh, he was always grousing, he was always grousing. I didn't do it, I, blah, 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 blah. and he was, he was using a walker, he was always in pain, and he was always grousing. The next cycle, I saw him, no walker. He, he, he looked happy. He lost some weight. 
I said, man, you're looking good. I said, what happened? He said, Mike, I finally accepted responsibility for my crime. And from there, so many guys I've seen from, from that point, I had another guy, he had a, a, a LWAP sentence and he, he was resigned. He was never getting out. He took my class and at the end of the class, he thanked me, he said, I'm going to help the guys that come in. If they have a chance to get out, I'm going to show them how. If they're like me and they, they may never get out, I'm going to show them how to help others. And then the next cycle, he wasn't in my class. He saw me in, on the yard. He said, Mike, can I just pop into your class? I said, sure, come on in. And he told a story. And then he said, can I tell another story in Spanish? Because most of my, my, my class was Spanish speaking. And he said, this is for the Paisans. And as he was telling a story and he was da 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 And the guys were like, they were just soaking it up. And afterwards, Every guy went up and thanked him. And then they, uh, they, 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 they saw how, I saw how he was doing what he said he wanted to do. He was using his skill to help others. It's a beautiful thing. Thank you for that, Michael D. Um, and, and Howard, I knew you would really just do a good job sort of tying these themes together. And we do have, um, if it's okay, a couple specific questions from the audience. Thank you, Mary Jo and uh, Lori, that I'm hoping either Kelly or Su Susan maybe want to touch on. Um, and feel free to just pick one of these if you'd like. But two questions related to what we call kind of the um, abuse to prison pipeline. So one question is what happens to um, in these domestic violence situations, the people that maybe caused that abuse, right? The survivor of the abuse ends up incarcerated. What generally, is there anything we can say about what generally happens to that other person? Um, keeping in mind that we don't want anybody sentenced to life without the possibility of parole and anybody deemed disposable. And then a second question, feel free to pick one. Have the laws changed about women who defend themselves against abuse? <laughs> um, the the people, the women I've know, I've know, their abusers make them take the time because they tell, they convince them because they're in the abuse mindset, and the abuser convinces them that they won't get as much time because they're a woman. So they take a lesser sentence. The woman says, oh, I, I'll, I'll take it, and ends up getting a life tale, a life without, and so forth, because she doesn't understand that they give them harsher sentences for the women. The men get crime of passion. The women get, you planned it, you manipulated it. That's back in my day. I don't know today. I know that Fiona Ma's bill went through that is helping domestic violence from forward, but didn't help us retro. Um, so there's a couple different things. Um, yeah, the bill did benefit, but um, it mostly benefits at board to look at where, um, you know, how it was, uh, you were affected by abuse. Unfortunately, instead of, um, DAs being accountable and, and stepping up to say, maybe I made the wrong sentence. Um, there's very few that, that benefited. I think about 40 where the DA said outright, I'm not going to fight this and I'm going to give you an opportunity um, at resentencing. But for the most part, unfortunately, um, all the way back to when you're first getting um, in contact with the police instead of looking at who looks like the victim and how we're going to treat them. Um, it's automatically, you know, how can I find a, a, a charge 
for each individual um, instead of what it should be looking at that victim and looking at what it should be like. Um, I found firsthand, um, I was absolutely blessed at my legal team on my appeal. Um, they actually got a document of what it should look like. Every county should adopt a policy of, of looking at that victim in that in initial moment and, and working with them instead of how can I find more charges to charge somebody with? Um, and unfortunately, that's what, what the system is like. Um, most people I know, they're either charged with that co-defendant. Um, that was my situation. It at times, especially for my family, is extremely difficult to know that I fight for um, all individuals not to have the sentence because my co-defendant is sentence this way um, as well. And I basically was informed that I should have been psychic and knew what he was capable of. Um, and, you know, and that was why I was being sentenced. Um, that was extremely difficult to hear and understand that that's how the system works is how many people can we incarcerate and how high can we get their sentence to be, whether it's in decades or it's in no hope of getting out at all. And um, extremely difficult to see that that happens way more than, often than not. Um, it is great to know that people like Michael D's um, uh, person at Valley State continued the program I helped create in the institution and to, come, to find out how many people are incarcerated because they didn't step up or they thought that the woman would get less automatically um, DAs start with, you're the mastermind because you're the female and not the perpetrator of the crime. And that is sad, um, but that is like a, a basic protocol for prosecutors to do. You're either um, the mastermind or, you know, um, you are the person who should have stepped up and stopped it because you're a female and, and um, you know, should have nurturing ability as if men, Aren't, you know, don't have the capacity to understand right and wrong, the woman should have done that. And that's extremely wrong. It's part of the system that needs to change. Yeah, what, there. thank you, Kelly and Susan for chiming in on that. And there, it's extremely patriarchal, right? Those types of assumptions and the particular ways in which women are demonized and criminalized is being, you know, sneaky, manipulative, the person conspiring on it all. Um, so thank you for shedding some light on that and for folks for asking those questions. Um, I wanted to move to one other question from the audience that is just a little more broad, which is what can be done slash what can I do, which is exactly the type of thinking we're hoping to inspire this evening to ensure that basic needs are met. And so I think that this came up and thank you for this, Sarah Armstrong. Um, when you, Kelly, maybe were talking about being denied something as basic as a self-help class or an educational class. And so I would consider a basic need hope even. That's come up a lot to keep a lifeline of hope with people who are disenfranchised and being treated as disposable. So you can answer it in that context, but really broadly, what can people do to kind of carry this spirit forward after this event tonight? Absolutely, that's easy. Um, getting involved in any of the campaigns to help somebody inside, whether it is um, something I tell everyone, write somebody from inside. If you don't know how to get in contact with someone who is seeking support, you can work with CCWP. We have a Writing Warriors program that allows us the ability to offer support to people inside. Um, I write hundreds of people every week um, because there are so many people who just want to know that there's hope available. Um, a lot of family has um, been lost due to decades of uh, incarceration. And so having that support from an outside person, not to say I'm offering financial support, I'm talking about what I do on my vacation or what I do for work, or I did a Google search about something fun, um, you know, that happened, in, you know, at a beach trip uh, someone took that I just saw on Google. It doesn't have to be your personal life, um, you know, that you're giving up 
you're you're offering up something to think about outside of the uh, carceral system. Um, you know, donating time or energy to one of our campaigns or being involved in in any of the work to just educate a neighbor, a friend. I watched this webinar and this is what I learned and and maybe you could consider looking at it. You know, it is everybody's job to look towards bettering this community, whether it is the community in a, a certain area or whether it is your work community, it is our job to make it better, not worse. Um, you know, whether it's offering a smile to somebody that you see walking down the street, it's our job. Why do we want to live in a place of less than? Why do we want to say that somebody doesn't deserve basic human kindness? It, it's just a negative way of looking at life. Most of us want to better where we're at and do things to, to show that betterment. So, you know, writing a letter once a month or sending a JPay, which is an app that allows you to send emails back and forth to the individual without sharing your personal contact information. You just log on a site and that gives that individual inside access just to your name. And so by having just that access, it allows you something different. If I could jump in, uh, Courtney, I just want the audience to know that, you know, basic needs um, to programming, as Kelly had mentioned, you know, LWOPs were denied access to certain college courses, certain vocational programs, certain work assignments. So currently right now, there's a bill, AB 292. It's authored by Mark Stone. It has passed through all of the committees and appropriations, and it is uh, on its way to the governor's desk or on the governor's desk. And again, that's Assembly Bill 292. Uh, if you wanna get involved, call the governor's office, encourage him and urge him to sign 292. This bill would prevent uh, emergencies uh, like COVID, or, or, or other kind of lockdown situations that would bar incarcerated people from having access to programs, to activities, to church. Um, most of the folks inside are not sentenced to solitary confinement. They're not sentenced to death. But, you know, we have to make these, these conditions better for folks inside so that they can survive it and come out to our communities. So AB 292 is a way that people can get involved by calling the governor and in support uh, of 292 to ensure that programming will continue inside of prisons for everyone doing emergency situations. Thank you for that, Ro Marilyn. Yes, so we're, we're giving you kind of the um, what to do in your lifetime responses and what you can do tonight or tomorrow. Um, so supporting that bill, literally just calling up the governor's office. This is why I want you to sign it. Thank you. Goodbye. Also sharing the YouTube link to this event tonight with your networks, especially people who maybe aren't always thinking about these things would be extremely valuable. So thank you for that question. If I can maybe start to move us toward closing out. Um, another question we wanted to pose, and Michael, D, Susan, Howard, maybe you want to speak to this one, but it's a big question. Angela Davis, Dr. Angela Davis has posed this question to all of us as a society. Is there a need for prisons or should prisons be obsolete? And I'll just add to that. If the answer is yes, maybe now or in the future, what would it take? to make prisons obsolete. Michael D, our storyteller's shirt says, prisons do not disappear social problems. They disappear human beings. So Michael, I see you coming off mute. What would you like to say? Several things. I got a big mouth and I love to run it. Um, I have a friend who works in Norway, Sweden and things like that where they have uh, 
entirely different take on prisons. It's not a dehumanizing, it's not a throw away idea, it's how can we help people deal with what they need, need to deal with in order to be in society. Uh, in Norway, in some of those places, uh, uh, any sentence, whatever, it, the max sentence can be 20 years. And while you're in prison, you're getting an education, you're getting help, with, with, whether physical, mental, and what have you. It's about mindset. And that's, now that's a big one. That's a big one. We got we to gotta work on that one. In the meantime, what can you do on a day-to-day -day basis to make somebody's life a little bit better? Find that out. Me, one of the, I give kids books. I No, I give people books. I give people books. I keep books in my car. Daniel was really tripped out. My, my, my guy in my class, when he found out that I told a story about how I was someplace and I asked this kid if he'd like to read. He said, no, I don't like to read. I said, you like Tupac? He said, yeah, I like Tupac. I got a book on Tupac. <laughs> Dang. What can you do? Um, like Howard sat down with that guy and talked to him. Uh, I remember once I was in New York and I saw this uh, homeless, well, yeah, he, I, I assumed he was a homeless guy. He was begging um, for money to get on the subway. And I had uh, some sandwiches or something like that. I gave him a sandwich. He said, yeah, that's good, but I still need to get on the subway. <laughs> so what can you do? Don't, sometimes we get, uh, and we get overwhelmed. What little thing can you do to help anybody, somebody on a day-to-day -day basis? Some of you know, I give these little cards out to people all over the place, little pop-open cards with a positive message. I gave one to a, a guy with his six-year-old daughter. It was her birthday. I gave her some cards. They were really appreciative. What can you do on a day-to-day -day basis, on a person-to-person -person basis, to make somebody feel good. Hope, hope, hope is so essential. There's that line, I don't remember off the top of my head, the, uh, uh, what's the, the Shawshank Redemption, he talks about hope. And we use that in, our, in, in my class to, to talk. And people talk about how when you have hope, that can change everything. What can we do? and do it. And that's the end of that. <laughs> Howard. Well, I'm going to I'm going to put on my political hat now, which I pretty much never take off anyway. And I want to say um, we need to do something about private for profit prisons. Because uh, currently and I'm looking this up uh, as of 2019, there were 116,000 state and federal prisoners housed in privately owned prisons in the US, which is about 8.1%. And if you're in a business, your goal is to make profit. And the way a private prison makes profit is by incarcerating people for as long as possible. What kind of country do we have that says, hey, we should have private prisons and we should make sure that we keep them full so that those prison owners make a good profit and can give returns to their shareholders. And I think the private prison system needs to be abolished. That is a crime against humanity. Amen. Yes, indeed. Kelly or Susan? And, and I know you have a thought there. No, nah, I almost lost <laughs> it. Um, get in touch with your assembly, get in touch with your senators, get, you know, when these bills come around that, that are saying, you know, one in three, one, one every three days, somebody gets an LWAP sentence. That's that's what it's it's ending up being. So one in one every three days, somebody loses the rest of their life. So that's something that needs to be fixed. That they need to get rid of the stupid LWAP sentence. So you can, you can do it. You can you know that one phone call. You just might be the one to touch them. You might just be the one to say, 
hey, no, no more. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Kelly? I Should think um, be obsolete? Every, absolutely. Um, I think that individuals, as I said, everybody's redeemable and individuals being set in a, in a cell isn't creating healing for anyone. Um, you know, there's a lot of individuals who are fighting DAs and, and prosecutors that are, are saying, I need you to come fight this, this person's release. Um, individuals who are saying, I want to step up and, and attend a board hearing because I want to support the person's release. And all of a sudden now they're um, not receiving the paperwork to attend a hearing. Um, individuals who want and deserve to have that opportunity to speak their heart and their mind. And um, it needs to be across the board. Every single person who is eligible to attend, whether they're supporting the person or not, should have that right. Um, as well as some education and um, restorative justice for individuals who want the opportunity to have communication with the victim um, or that victim who wants to speak to somebody who has caused harm. Um, unfortunately, a lot of institutions um, don't back or support that option of taking place. And, um, you know, victims deserve the right to have that uh, confrontation um, and, and have that healing and that uh, dialogue to happen. And it should happen. Um, but saying somebody, you know, who has made a mistake or, you know, a, an action that caused serious harm just doesn't deserve to ever do anything right in life again is just unacceptable. And I know it's possible. We just have to realize that every person has had experiences and unfortunately hurt people hurt people. And so once we start to acknowledge that and move towards healing and move towards restorative justice, I think that change can occur. Well, thank you. Thank you everyone for such a rich conversation tonight. And the stories that you have shared have totally taken us on some journeys into the lives of people who have been the most marginalized folks in our state. And those people need our help. Those people need our support. What I've heard tonight kind of resonates with the words of Ruthie Wilson Gilmore, where life is precious, life is precious. We are all deserving of life deserving of the opportunity to heal, to be whole, to be forgiven, to have hope, to have dreams. So tonight I am encouraged that our audience has been given that light from all of you tonight. Each of you have touched my heart, touched my soul, given me a lot to think about tonight. I am eternally grateful for the opportunity to be a part of this webinar tonight and so grateful for this conversation. Courtney? I don't want to follow that, Real Marilyn. I think that was our closing statement. So I just want to thank everyone on YouTube. We see you. We see the donations coming in. Most importantly, we see that you're here and present and we appreciate your thoughtful and really just loving remarks in the chat and being engaged. So thank you all so much.